Good morning and welcome to worship at Markham Woods Presbyterian Church on this, what is it? Palm Sunday. We talked today that some of the younger generations are not as familiar with these, these traditions that we have been, uh, the church has been living with for a thousand years or plus. So uh, it is Palm Sunday and we, we welcome you. A few announcements. Uh, number one, it is Palm Sunday, which means you might have been handed a palm frond. Did you? Okay, so be prepared to wave your palm from on the uh, processional. If you, like many of us do, uh, fold those into the shape of a cross every year, I think I have about 10 in my office, there are instructions uh, in the, at the Welcome Center that will tell you exactly. I see Joe Walsh back there has already folded his into a cross. Yeah, so uh, there you go. <laughs> if you'd like to do that, uh, we have those instructions as well. There's a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, uh, it is Palm Sunday. This is the, the beginning of the end of the journey of Lent. We walk this week through Holy Week, which contains two very important worship uh, events prior to Easter. The, the, the country, the world understands Easter for the most part. They understand that Christians celebrate Easter, but they don't know why. The why is what's often missing, and the why gets explained through two services uh, on Thursday night, Monday, Thursday. It's a, it's a service with communion. It's, it's uh, kind of reliving that moment when Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. Uh, we'll experience that with a special washing of hands with a uh, traditional uh, Hebrew prayer that's said before you take the bread. We'll do that. There's child care for that as well. Then the next, very next night, Good Friday, we have our Good Friday Tenebrae. Tenebrae just means a service of shadows. That means that while we're worshiping, it'll slowly become uh, darker in the sanctuary as Jesus gets closer to the cross. It's a very moving and dramatic service. Uh, if you have never been, it's very touching. I invite you to come both at seven o'clock. Both have child care. Uh, yeah, just a few more announcements. So Easter Sunday, we will have services at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And we will have an Easter egg hunt at 1030 with a petting zoo as well with a fluffy cow named Panda. Uh, for those who are interested in that. A panda? Uh, named Panda. Oh, yeah, oh. No, not an actual panda. So we, I know the budget <laughs> would handle a panda, no, no, J.D. No. Maybe next year. Um, but uh, so there's that. And then the last thing that I, I want to keep reiterating is we are having an author speaker coming to our church uh, Saturday, April 6th. She'll be here at 3 p.m. talking through a book um, that she wrote. As a, She's a radiation oncologist, and she kind of wrote it about her faith um, in that journey. It's a creative writing piece, and it's, 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 very, uh, it's a great book. So anyways, I encourage you to be there for that. Uh, we'll have coffee and snacks. And I think that's... Panda. At no the, panda. No panda. At the, uh, <laughs> however, there will be a spaghetti dinner coming up. And I don't know if there's a slide for that. But last year, Cheryl and Heathrow Christian Academy, our school, put on a spaghetti dinner. But it was also a come and see where you could go and tour. Some people have never been back to our facility. It is an amazing facility. It is state of the art. And we invite you to come back for that on that Wednesday. Last but not least... Uh, did we talk about the Alpha Marriage Course? No. Alpha Marriage Course is going to begin shortly. If you're curious about that, I don't see Chris in here right now, but Chris Leinenkugel is the uh, kind of heads that up, and you can call the church if you need to find out how, if you want to be a part of that Alpha Marriage Course. It's, it, it's included dinner. It's done very uh, privately. You're at your own table. You don't sit at a table with everybody. So all the couples are kind of spread out. I've been to these things before that are kind of awkward. Uh, this is not. It's very inviting. So I think that finishes our announcements. All right. With that being said, let us stand together and greet one another in the name of Christ as we begin our worship.
Father, we thank you that you are in this place, that your son is here, and as they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem, so we welcome Jesus now into this church and into our lives, and we just pray that you would be with us in this worship, that you would continue to, to bring with us that joy and that peace that you brought when you entered Jerusalem. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join with me in the call to worship this morning, which comes from Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It is a marvelous sight to all who believe. The Lord has done it this very day. And let us rejoice and be glad by standing for our gathering hymn, All Glory, Loud, and Honor. Please be seated, except for any children who want to come up for the message this morning. We're going to squeeze in around these palms here. Come on up. Good morning, good morning. You guys did great waving the palms. You did great. <laughs> good morning. So... <laughs> Good morning, good morning. All right, so I have a question to start us off here. Do you guys know what expectations are? No? Does anybody have a guess? Okay, let me tell you. Expectations are, you know, uh, one of the kids in the first service said that it was like a job. And in some ways it is kind of like a job. 
an expectation is something that we anticipate someone doing. So, for example, if my mom is a good cook, which she is, then I expect the dinner to be really good at night. So when I come home for dinner, I expect it to be good. So if it wasn't good, I, I would be very confused, right? So that's what an expectation is. So I have another question. Next Sunday, what's next Sunday? Anybody? Easter egg hunt and Easter. Yep, exactly, exactly. An Easter egg hunt and Easter. So what do I have here? An egg, An egg right. Now, what do we usually have in Easter eggs? What are some examples? Surprises. surprises. That's good. Yeah, candy and surprises. So if you were to guess what's in here, what do you think is in here? A light bulb. What do you guess? A light bulb. Okay, a light bulb? A bouncy ball. A bouncy ball? Anything else? What about what? what? Candy. candy. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, well, let's see. You guys ready to see? I'm ready to see. You see that? What is that? It's a battery. It's a battery. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I think we're going to have better things in our eggs next Sunday. Um, but, you know, I actually needed a battery because my remote back home needs a battery, so this, this should do the trick. But the reason I did this is because today, as we wave these palm fronds, you know, we were welcoming Jesus in as a king because that's what they did thousands of years ago. They welcomed Jesus into a, the city as a king, but Jesus, kind of like this Easter egg, was not the kind of king that they expected. They expected something to be in here, and it was a little different, but even though it was different, it was exactly what the people needed, because he was a king that wasn't going to rule over people and be mean. He was a king of love, and he was a king of peace. And so that's kind of what we're celebrating today as he takes his journey into Jerusalem. So thank you guys for being up here. Would you join me in a, in a sharing prayer? Father God, we thank you that you are a king, not the king that we expected, but a good king who loves us and cares for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for being up here. Isn't it wonderful, all these palms? You had palms from the first service, and now they've added to them, all representing uh, children in the church. It's great. I, I took a little time off last week. I left immediately after worship and drove it straight up to the mountains of North Carolina uh, because Elisa's uncle has a wonderful cabin up there. And I don't know if you saw the weather. Did you see it? 21 degrees, 35-mile-an-hour <laughs> wind. Wind chill about 10 degrees. It was lovely. I didn't expect it, JD. It was unexpected. So because it is winter time, we got up there. The driveway is like goes uphill, and it's one of these houses kind of built into the mountain. And all the leaves had fallen uh, all year. I guess no one had been up there taking care of that part of it. And the leaves were piled up about knee-deep in front of the garage doors. And since it was going to get down to 21, we wanted to pull the cars inside. So we raise up the, the, the doors and all those leaves start to blow in. I get a rake. I went out and Elise and I, for about 10 minutes, tried to rake these leaves off the side of the mountain, which we did until the wind blew <laughs> right up the mountain. And it blew every one of those leaves right back up, and it made like this vortex, and it was swirling. The leaves was like the Wizard of Oz. The leaves were swirling around just the way the house was laid out. So we just gave up. We gave up because it was useless. The, the swirling chaos prevented everything. And isn't that how it is for us? It's the swirling chaos, and you could name your own chaos that swirls around. And sometimes those swirls actually prevent us from getting closer to God. But in our tradition and in worship, especially communal worship like this, we have the history of the saints before us that said we can come before the Lord and we can tell them of the chaos, tell them of the futility of raking the troubles down the hill only to have them blow right back on us. And we're going to do that now in our prayer of confession. Would you join with me? Heavenly Father, 
We ask for your forgiveness for the times we've allowed the distractions of this world to overshadow our pursuit of your truth in scriptures and through the intimacy of prayer. Grant us the wisdom to release our preconceived notions of who you are and instead grant us the grace to listen attentively to your voice speaking into our lives. Open our hearts to fully receive your love and guidance. Hear our contrite hearts, O Lord, as we seek your mercy and renewal. Amen. I remember the story in Scripture, and I think I referred to it last week, of Jesus stilling the storm. He he stood up in the boat, and he said, Peace, be still. And the swirling winds and the waves calm down. When we offer our confession, Jesus says, Peace, be still. What was broken has been repaired. The errors that were made have been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For filling out the prayer cards. You know they're in the pews. You can get them at the kiosk out front as well. Thank you for doing this. As we make these prayers our prayers, and we can offer them together to the Lord. So let's join together. Lord God, we come as your people. We know we're forgiven, but it also means we're renewed. If we're renewed, we're able to reach out and become that healing hand, that touch that you call us to do. And we want to do that today in prayer, all of us joining together, all those in this uh, sanctuary of worship, all those watching online. We take a moment and we put all of our hopes and our prayers together under this roof we call sanctuary. Lord, we pray today for uh, Emma, who sprained her ankle. She's not feeling well. She's usually here in in helping us, so we do pray for Emma. And for Jerry, Lord, liver resection this Sunday. Uh, They found some tumors, and and there's going to be more treatments. And, Lord, that's hard. And so would you enter that hard place and bring some softening and some comfort and some healing? Lord, we're also thinking about Betty Powers' family today as Betty's cousin, Beth, has has gone to be with you. And Beth occasionally was right here in this space, worshiping with us. Now she's with you, Lord God. We pray condolence and healing peace. For Brooks, four years old, he touched a motorcycle pipe, Lord, he burned his hand really badly. For a four-year-old, that's hard. It's hard for anyone. You can bring cooling comfort, cooling comfort, like those waters flowing freely and bring the healing. Lord, we also pray for Bob. Bob has a diagnosis of cancer, and we remember all those in this worship and in this community that are dealing with cancer, have dealt with cancer. <clears throat> Some have done that and had these miraculous outcomes, Lord, and why not again? We pray for it once again. With these prayers on this Palm Sunday where we do have expectations of you intersecting these very words we say with your spirit, we raise voices aloud with just names, Lord. Name, you know what lies behind the name. It's not the name, 
It's the power invoked as we raise that aloud. And we take that moment now to hear these names in our worship. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening and more than that, for acting as we offer all these prayers in the healing, the powerful, the miraculous name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What shall we give in the name of one who gave everything for us? What do we offer in thanksgiving for the steadfast, excuse me, the steadfast love proclaimed in Jesus Christ? How will good news be carried to the centers of power in our world today? What will we, what we give will make a difference. your heads in prayer what you have done for us is marvelous in our eyes gracious God our gifts can never match your goodness toward us your saving grace your healing light your personal sacrifice are so beyond our imagining we can only we can only offer ourselves all we have and all we are 
in response to the coming of Christ Jesus. Hosanna in the highest. Receive, O God, our humble service. Amen. Gather, confess what it is that we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us sing together our hymn of meditation, Your Only Son, which is found in the purple hymnal, number 518. Our first scripture lesson comes from Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Hear the word of the Lord. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. 
Today I declare that I will restore to you double. For I have bent Judah as my bow, I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will arouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and wield you like a warrior's sword. This is the word of the Lord. The choir is going to sing, and the people cried Hosanna, and they're going to invite us to join them at points. So she will tell us, and we'll know what to sing, but we look forward to this. I am glad I didn't have my mic on for that last note. <laughs> but that sounded really good. So as we continue in our mountain moving series today on Palm Sunday, today we are going to be talking about the mountain of expectations. Let me know if this sounds familiar to you. In elementary school, I remember being so excited to get into middle school because they had the lockers and they had the much cooler cafeteria and it just seemed way better. And then I got into middle school and I was like, okay, 
maybe high school will be better. So then I got excited to get into high school, and then you get excited for college, and then and then for your job, and then, you know, to get married, and then you get excited for your first child, and your first house, and, and then eventually retirement, and, you know, that's, that's the cycle. This cycle, I think, is one that all of us are familiar with, and have fallen into at times in our life, because no matter what your age, you have experienced the power of expectations, and maybe you've experienced the really negative side of this because society has put expectations on all of us. Depending on how old you are, if you're young, if you're old, if you're a construction worker, if you're a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, a Christian, a Muslim, a Presbyterian, a Baptist, there are mountains of expectations with each of these titles. And today, we're looking at a story that I would say contains more expectations for a single individual than any story ever recorded. And that is the story of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. If someone were to come and tell us that this next president is going to save the world, and the elections are coming up, someone's going to tell us the next president is going to save the world, so get ready. If they were to tell us this, we would all have different expectations for what this next president is going to do. Somebody in the first service shouted out that they would make a budget. We would all have different expectations. Maybe we expect them to get rid of poverty, to get rid of hunger, to, to buy everybody a nice house, right? Everybody is going to have different expectations. Well, on Palm Sunday, this is essentially what Jesus is walking into a huge mountain of expectations because apparently this guy is going to be the savior of the world. So that is the story that we're reading today. This is in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. It says, After he, he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. Now, as he was approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in, in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, to start off with some basic info for those who are unfamiliar with the story. This is Jesus' big triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this is during one of their huge festivals called Passover, where hundreds of thousands of people would gather to this one area. And the reason this story is so famous is because it's right before Good Friday. And so this is his entry into Jerusalem. Jesus has been waiting a long time to make a public, public entrance into Jerusalem. And eight days later will be the epitome of Christianity. Eight days later, he's crucified on a cross, and then he's risen. And so that's why Palm Sunday is, is so important, because this marks the journey of his trip into Jerusalem and all the crazy things that are about to happen that we will be able to experience throughout this week. And so what's going on in this story? Well, the people are treating his entry into Jerusalem as if he is the next king right? They're laying their cloaks down on the donkey and on the ground because a king does not tread on 
dirty ground. And they're laying their cloaks down as a sign of respect and tribute to the king to be. And then, of course, they're waving the palm branches, right, like we did today. And they did this because palm branches were a sign of victory. It wasn't just to fan Jesus because it's hot over in Jerusalem. They had these palm branches for a reason. They were a sign of victory. Olympic winners would would wear these these palm branches as a sign of victory. The victorious Roman gladiators would wear these palm branches. And most importantly for today... The coin that everybody used to buy things and exchange things in Jerusalem had a man on it. His name was Julius Caesar, and he, the emperor, had palm branches that he was wearing on this coin. And so they expected Jesus to be their king. That's what we're seeing in this story. They expected that Jesus was about to lead the people of Jerusalem into an uprise to overthrow the Roman occupation of the time. The city had heard of these amazing miracles, right, that this man had done, that he'd healed people, he'd raised people from the dead, he'd done all these amazing powers, he'd calmed the sea. And so they expect that he can use that power to take the city back finally and take it away from Roman occupation. And so that's what people are expecting And it's not just that. Those are some of the expectations. But as we dive deeper, a lot of history has led up into this moment. For example, when we see an Olympic skier at the top of one of these mountains, at the top of this ramp, they're about to do a high jump. And they go 60 miles per hour down this ramp. And then they fly off of the ramp to see how far they can go before landing their feet in the snow. Well, we can assume, rightly so, that somebody did not just give this person a pair of skis and put them up there and say good luck, right? A lot has led up to this moment, and it's the same way with the Savior of the world. A lot of history has led up to this moment. And so I want to go through a little bit of that today. We can see it all in the Bible. One of the reasons that that the Bible is one of the most amazing books in the world, even if you don't believe in Jesus, people recognize it. It's an amazing piece of literature. It's an amazing piece of art. One of the reasons they recognize that is because the Bible was not written in 15 years. It wasn't written in 30 years. It wasn't written in 50 years, 100. It was written over the course of thousands and thousands of years. They estimate that the oldest book in the Bible is about 3,500 years years old. And they also estimate that it took about 1,500 years of active writing and recording of history in order to have the canon that we have today. And what's contained in the Bible? Well, in the Bible we have history, we have poetry, we have music in some ways, wisdom, and what else do we have? For today's story, This is important. We have a lot of prophecy. As Jesus went into this town, there were a lot of prophecies about who this Messiah was supposed to be. A man named James George actually gives us the statistical probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight of these prophecies. What are the chances one man could fulfill eight of these prophecies? Well, he took these eight prophecies calculated the probability, and he gave us this. It says, to answer the question, what is the probability of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies? The principle of probability is applied. Therefore, multiplying all eight probabilities together gives us one in ten quadrillion chance of him fulfilling these prophecies. Now, I can't lie. I I copied that number, and I put it into Google, and they couldn't tell me how to say it, so I made that up. It's not ten quadrillion. But it's a big number, right? Google couldn't even tell me what the number was. It is a big number. So the chances are slim. And the people know this. They might not know the statistics, but they know that it's slim. They've had other people say and claim they're going to be the Messiahs come by. So the chances are slim. But 
to make it even more interesting, as he entered Jerusalem, there were not just eight prophecies about what this man was supposed to do and be like. There were an estimated 574 prophecies about what the Messiah was supposed to be like. And so here's a list of just a couple of the prof prophecies that he fulfilled in his lifetime. It's over the course of two slides. It's about 300 um, that I have on there. Things like he'll be born in Bethlehem, he'll, he'll raise the dead, he'll heal the blind, he, his bones will not be broken, uh, nations and rulers will plot against him, uh, there will be physical torment, people will divide his clothes. I mean, the list goes on, right? These are specific things, they're not just, you know, general things. There's some, some specific prophecies that they really expect this guy to fulfill. And so this is just a small glimpse of the mountain of expectations for the Messiah. Now, you can imagine the weight on your shoulders for something like this. Many of us have experienced the, the weight of expectations, right? We've, we've experienced disappointing people and, and just this weight of expectations that people might have for us to, to be a certain way or do a certain thing. We know how that feels. Well, Jesus, who suffered all things for our sake, also suffered the weight of expectations. He constantly was disappointing someone. We see it all throughout the scriptures. Jesus was not a people pleaser. Whether it was the, the Pharisees or even the disciples, the Greeks or the Jews, people laughed at him and they mocked him because he was not doing the things that they thought he would do. For example, you know, you have the Pharisees calling him a drunkard and a, and a sinner for sitting with, with tax collectors. They expected their Messiah to be more holy than that. And the disciples, there's another story where, where this expensive oil was, was being put on his feet, and the disciples are almost criticizing him in some ways. They say, why don't you sell this and give it to the poor? Everyone had expectations for Jesus, and he disappointed just about everybody. So I think the question is, you know, we, we see this up until the cross. So Jesus was being crucified on the cross. I have one more example. He's being crucified on the cross, and they say to him, he's, they say he saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, his chosen Right, So we see these expectations. And so the question is, why were people so disappointed and angry with Jesus? Well, I think they were disappointed and angry with Jesus because they had a mountain of expectations about what the Messiah was supposed to look like and act like. And for many of them, Jesus did not fit the mold. But Jesus was focused solely on fulfilling God's expectations for him, fulfilling God's purpose for him and his life. That's why right after when he, he enters Jerusalem, this is just how Jesus is, he enters Jerusalem, everybody's thinking that he's going to get rid of the Romans and, and make it so that the temple's going to get bigger and remain there forever, and what does he do? He goes straight to the temple. People are probably expecting him to be there, and what does he do? He flips the tables. He flips the tables, and, and then he predicts that this temple won't be standing much longer. Because Jesus was fulfilling the mission of God. He was fulfilling the mission of his Father. And the mission of his Father was to build the true temple of God that is all of us, and people all around the world. And that didn't make a lot of people happy. But Jesus was fulfilling the mission of God and God alone. It's interesting because if we read the scripture carefully that we just read, Jesus asked his disciples to go get a donkey, right? We know that. But he asked for a specific kind of donkey. He asked for a donkey that has never been ridden before. Well, why does he do this? Well, because in Jewish tradition, and all the Jewish people would know this, when David passed down the royalty from his, from his throne to the throne of Solomon, 
he rode the donkey, Solomon rode the donkey that David had. The tradition goes that the next king rides the donkey that the other king had ridden. But Jesus, I think, is asking for a donkey that has never been ridden before because he's telling us and he's telling the people that he's a king unlike any king they've ever seen before. He's not a king that has been given the royalty by man. He's a king who's been given royalty and power and authority by God. And that's a different kind of king. I think there are at least two questions that God is asking us through this story. The first one is, are we letting the mountain of expectations affect us as disciples? Are we following the way of Jesus and living our life focused on what God wants for us, what we believe God wants for us, or are we focused on what our family thinks of us, or are we focused on what our friends think of us, or our co-workers, or society at large? And are the expectations we have for ourselves making us talk negatively about ourselves when we have God-given value in Christ, right? Expectations can manipulate us in many different ways, from others and for ourself. Because I think expectations work just like chains. As soon as we accept them, we're bound by the fulfillment of them or the lack thereof. That's how expectations work. That is why they are a burden. But Christ says we are set free due to his grace and his mercy. And that is the blessing that we have that Jesus gives us on Palm Sunday. I've, an example is I, I've told this before. When I went to my fraternity and I, and I, uh, my senior year, I offered to start up a Bible study. I was really scared because we always got in this huge circle and you'd make announcements as needed. But most of the announcements were not Bible studies. They were usually not good things. <laughs> and I stood there and I, I gave the announcement of my Bible study. It was not what people expected. And I don't think it's what a lot of people wanted. People expected me to, to just go along with whatever else was, was happening. But I felt the expectations of God were different, and so I did that. And there are many times where I felt the expectations of God, and I haven't gone through with it. That is the story of our life. But the story of our life is pursuing those expectations of God as best as we can. Number two, the question number two is, are we letting the mountain of expectations affect our relationship with Jesus. This is an interesting one, and, and I admit when I was planning the sermon, I spent hours and hours trying to figure out what my expectations are of God, because I think we all have expectations of who Jesus is. Maybe we think Jesus is this hippie guy, for example, who has all this grace and mercy and just wants us to, to do whatever, whatever we want and let our kids do whatever they want. Maybe we think Jesus is more like this person, the disciplinarian, who wants to set our kids straight and then put them in a, in a, in a whatever, you know, make them do the, the right things. Maybe we think Jesus doesn't care if we go to a party and have a couple drinks. Maybe we think Jesus would hate for us to go to a party and have a couple drinks. Maybe we think Jesus wants us to have more grace for ourselves. Maybe we think Jesus wants us to have more discipline for ourselves. Maybe we think Jesus wants us to have more rest in our life. Maybe we think he wants us to have, to, to work more in our life. Well, all of these things are expectations that we have. But I think the message today is we cannot let those expectations run our relationship with Jesus. If we're in a relationship, in a, in a marriage, we don't just run off of expectations. We ask. We ask and we seek. And that is what we are called to do as Christians with Jesus. Because I think Jesus wants us to get rid of those expectations. I think the only expectation that God calls us to have, that Jesus calls us to have, is the expectation of God's goodness and faithfulness. That's the only expectation that we need in life. And so I want to end this sermon a little bit differently. I want us to go to God in prayer because I think that this is one way that is extremely practical and we don't really think about it much of a way to really give these expectations to God and seek the Lord and seek his understanding and his guidance in our lives. So 
let us go to God in prayer. And you can repeat the words in your head that I say, or you can pray your own thing uh, as I'm praying, but let us just go to God in prayer. Jesus, I give everything and I give everyone to you. I give you all of my expectations. I give you the expectations I, I have for others. I give you the expectations that they might have for me. I give you all of them because it is out of your goodness, for the sake of my freedom, that you have suffered the burden. And I thank you for that. I choose Jesus to let go of my expectations for you, of who I think you're supposed to be, of who I think you are, and I choose the desire to know who you truly are. I don't expect you, Jesus, to, to move the mountains in my life, but I do expect that you are good and that you have a good plan for my life, whether I understand it or not. I trust in you, Jesus. We, as a church, trust in you. And it's in your holy name that I pray this. Amen. If you would please stand for our hymn of response, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. I leave you with this. You might have a lot of expectations about what today is going to be like or about what the next season of life is going to be like for you, but I encourage you to let those all go and to simply expect in the goodness of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>